Hi, I'm Tony Amatula. I'm going to be on the Corey Oliver show, Corey Alice, uh, and we're going to be talking about my new feature debut, uh, my new feature, Surviving on LES, and a couple of projects uh, on books that I've optioned that will be uh, coming down the pike. Welcome to the Coriolis Effect with Corey Oliver. Hi guys, I'm Corey Oliver. Thanks for watching the Coriolis Effect. Please hit the subscribe button below and we hope you like this episode. Hi guys, we wanted to announce that like many podcasters, we just started a Patreon account. Visit our page at patreon.com backslash the Coriolis Effect. We have five different levels of membership and offer early access to episodes, behind the scenes footage, bonus episodes, shout outs, and much more, including personal phone calls, questions and answer sessions, and live chats with Bob and me. That's patreon.com backslash the Coriolis effect. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Corey. How are you? Mm. Mm. Still drinking my coffee. I got mm. this really good new coffee called Cafe du Mondo. Called coffee. Coffee. Café, is that it? Café du Mondo. I like, like the to store, sound good. Uh, yeah. The story shop at Target. It's and, really good. I actually just flew back from Arizona and the couple that we were staying with um, served it. And I was like, this is really that you good. The couple we were staying with? And with my best friend. Oh, really? It was actually her um, stepson and his wife. And they were, they were this was their morning coffee and it was amazing. Oh, so really I, cool. I ordered it. It was really good. Um Yes. There's lots to talk about. Okay. There's just so much going on. I don't even know when this episode will air, but and we're up. No. Sorry. <laughs> don't don't turn the channel. Don't uh, stop the podcast. Go ahead. Oh, I've missed you. We had a couple weeks break here, <laughs> know, really. and now I we're back. Save up all my smart ass remarks. He's ready to res <laughs> respond. <laughs> um, how are you, first and foremost? I'm very, very well. Good. Uh, 90, How's your rib? I was going to say ninety percent healed. Okay, good. That so, was fast. Yeah, it's, well, it's been five weeks. Oh, that's still pretty fast. Thank yeah. you, God. We were I'm praying gonna, for you. I'm going to try to play this week and see what happens. You're on the mend and you're going to play it's again? five weeks. I haven't played This is what I don't weeks. even understand about guys. They're just like, eh, yeah, my leg's broken, but I'm going to go back out and play football. <laughs> Lou Gehrig played with broken bones. I know. And then when he went to the hospital and they x-rayed him, they said, you yeah, know, you've had this bone broken like 14 other times. And he said, ah, oh, that's a different. So let's go. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and I can't remember the guy's name. He was a, I think, a defensive lineman, maybe offensive lineman for the Cowboys. Um, I'll have to get his name and put it on the screen below. But um, he was an amazing player, and he got his finger caught in somebody's helmet, and it broke the finger. So uh -huh. he went to the you know the doctor at, uh, on the sidelines, and the guy said, we're going to cast it. You're out the rest of the season. He said, yeah, take the finger. And they amputated his finger so he could no play. And way. the Dallas Cowboys were in the Super Bowl that year. So he actually got to, otherwise he wouldn't have been in the Super Bowl. He'd have missed the whole season. So he said, it was his pinky. He said, take the finger. And he took the finger. You're kidding. I'm dead serious. I'll, if, I'll get his name. If but. that doesn't define taking one for the team. Yeah. No, <laughs> literally no, taking give, one for the giving team. Giving one for the team. But or yeah. giving one for the team. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, so getting rid of his finger, that didn't have to heal? I mean, didn't that well, take no, a long time? Well, no, because they can just stitch it up and bandage it. But it's not like <sighs> loose or anything. What I, I didn't so understand mean. why they couldn't. Because he's defenseman. It's not like he's got to grab something. Well, I guess I do grab you. But you could just lock the finger to something else and yeah. cast. But it would have been too painful. But I don't wow. think these guys. These guys care. are tough. I'm telling you. Yeah. I know. I, I've heard stories. Um, well, I mean, we've got so much to talk about today. I have a very dear friend of mine who is um, the creator and one of the producers on. Ronnie Beverly Lott. <laughs> <laughs> Beverly yeah, his name is Ronnie Lott. He was a defensive. I think it was defensive. Oh, uh, you're cowboy. going back to that. I yeah, was like, Ronnie no, that's Lott. not his on the, the guy show. Who lost his finger. No. <laughs> yeah, if we had Ronnie Lott on there, she was an amazing player. Yeah. I think I remember sorry. hearing that about I'm him. Yeah. I'm sorry, you were saying something? <laughs> <laughs> eh, no big deal. We'll just go with crickets. Yes. Silent. Um, no, I. Oh, wow. Got a button for that. Um, yes, one of our producers of, of Beverly Hills Pond is on today. Oh, Anthony cool. Amatulo. We call him Tony. Tony Amatulo. Hey, He's Tony. been in. Yeah. One of the nicest, most respectful men in the business, out of the business that I've ever met. He is just- Make him like the only respectful and nicest man well, in the business. Well, you know, I gotta say, he's really a class in a league of his own. He really is. And- um, He's a class act in a league of his own? He is, he he's is a, a class, class act, very classy. He would show up on set and be so respectful and he was just so kind. And 
you know, he's married and has two boys and he just was is a wonderful, wonderful man. And I'm very grateful that he um, has agreed to come on the show. He is responsible for, I brought some of these nostalgic little postcards. If anybody wants to write in, I'll send them one. Um, we have this this one from Beverly Hills Pond. That has a writing on the back. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Um, this one. So um, I have a few left and I'd be happy to give them out. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anybody wants them, but um, I was looking for things that that we had around the house, and posters and stuff, and I, I came up with those, but I'm very excited to have him on the show. He has a, a short called Surviving on Less, and it's very cute. It's really- Surviving on less, like less money and- On less, yes. Okay. And he, no, I believe it's, it's you're, you're mixing me up here. Um, well, let's talk about it when the show starts because okay. I don't want to give it away. We have a little clip that we'll show. It's not like a, how to do Europe on eighteen dollars a day. <laughs> Is that possible? Though there were books in the seventies and eighties where you could say it was like how to do this place in eighteen or twenty dollars a day. Yeah, they were all. In the I don't place. even think you could do that. Well, now it'd be now it'd be fifty dollars a day or hundred dollars right? a day, right? <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, I'm very excited to have Tony Amatulo on uh, today. He is in New York, so he will be a Zoom call. Um, but we'll get to catch up and just hear what he's doing. He's been in the business a very, very long time. He has, I've got some of his um, credits, A Smile Like Yours, Two Days in the Valley, Conflict of Interest, Dad, The Goonies. He goes way back. The Goonies. Dead, Dead Silence, Miami Vice, Fame. I mean, he has an incredible, incredible he resume. Miami Vice and Fame? Yeah, he's wow. been involved in all these projects and somewhere or another, and he's just a wonderful um, staple in Hollywood, in my opinion. Uh no. Just because of who he is. He's just a good guy, you know. Uh, remember to hit record when we interview him. <laughs> Could you? Yeah. That'd be so great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anything else going on before uh, Tony calls in? No, I mean, there's lots to talk about. There's so much going on in the world today. And maybe just to print this in in uh, in history, you know, we've got um, Alec Baldwin's movie, yeah, uh, which is growing and growing, the things that are going on on that set. And um as well as Travis Scott concert. Oh, God. That just seems to be, it's just so tragic and I don't know how those things ever happen. And well, I- freaked me out because Sammy's now living in Denver uh, by herself and she went to a concert and I forget what it was, but you know, I, I'm tracking her and she's calling me for five. And she, you know, was a kid there by herself. So she's moving up, moving up. And the concert was great. She came home and everything mm -hmm. was fine. But then like a week later this happened. I'm like, oh God. So I said, now, Sammy- Those you know, mosh pits are never good. And I've watched a lot of TikTok and, and everyone seems to have the same consensus and they all say these kids are all saying it just felt like it was hell mm -hmm. uh, and and it was they kept using the word it's not my word it's their word demonic and that it was just really yeah, the whole in, feeling was a a real scary feeling and that really can't move it's the same thing at the who concert from 91 where eight nine eight or nine people died they're they're rushing the state they're literally lifting up injured and, and dead bodies to get them over one guy um <sighs> with his girlfriend the girl passed out and she said her boyfriend literally lifted up and they crowd surfed her like four people down to get to a security guard who then revived her. But it-, it One it, of the security guards got stabbed in the neck with some yeah, substance. Yeah, they, they pricked with something, right? Um, <laughs> and they had to revive him with Narcan or whatever that is. It's like, so at that point, you know, who am I to say? I just, those when, things when are- When you're in that, it's like, you know, you go to the ocean, you don't realize until you go into water and realize yeah, how powerful the ocean sucks is. Sucks you in. You've got hundreds and thousands of people pushing in and the people in the back don't know what's going on. They just want to push up and- you can't, you know, 10 guys can't push back a thousand. So it's like the old thing, holding back the ocean with a broom. You, there's no way. It's an unstoppable force that's coming in. Yeah. And unless you get up and out of it, you will be crushed against a barrier. And that's what happened. What they should do though, it's is they should make those barriers breakaways. So that if you're pressed against a barrier and it's too much force, there's the barrier will fail and people, you know, will live. I think they should have barriers sub in between and it just should not be a big giant collective mosh pit. Right. It just, you can't breathe. These kids were like, I, I couldn't but, breathe. Okay, so now, now here's the other issue. We'll talk about this real quick. It, it, politics and life is always about what you choose to care about. And it's, oh my God, this is horrible. Four yeah. people died and it is horrible. Yeah, hundred people eight. are hurt. That's fine. Um, uh, 45, 50,000 car deaths every year. So the question is, what do we do? We know 50,000 people are gonna die next year in car accidents. Do we, everybody drive a tank? Do we well, stop automobiles knowing that 50,000 people are going to die? And, and I'll give you the, the most- That's the, different than two people that there's video of going up on stage and begging the concert, the everyone, I'm begging them, please stop the show. There are dead people in the audience. Stop the show. I've right. seen the yeah, videos. Yeah, it took like 40 minutes or something. Yeah. 
Yeah. But And the other one, I don't know if we talked about this, when they built the St. Louis Arch, the bean counter, people said, you know, you build this arch, it is most likely that seven people are going to die falling off at construction accidents, things like that. So somebody or group of people had to make the decision to build nothing but an aesthetic arch. It didn't have a, serve a purpose. They said, okay, build it. We know seven people are going to die. Build it anyway. Now, thank goodness mm -hmm. nobody died. It was like the best safety record of any. But these guys wow. were walking 660 feet in the air on steel girders. A lot of them without safety chains. Nobody got injured. Nobody died. But that's amazing because Golden Gate Bridge, yeah, not right. so much. Well, that was a different era, but yeah. Yeah. But so many. Well, I'm sorry. Somebody made the decision to go build this, knowing seven people are going to die. Panama Canal, thousands of people died. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's it is anyway. tragic here now. Yeah. But all right. So back to Tony Amatulo. Yes, we're very excited. Tony Amatulo is in the house today on on the Zoom today. In the Zoom today. <laughs> in the, on, Zoom on today. the Zoom today. Yes. All yeah. right. Then uh, we'll see you in a minute. Okay. This episode is sponsored by Brizo Healthy Fruit Tonic. With Manuka honey and apple cider vinegar, less than four grams of sugar, and under 35 calories per can, each of Brizo's four flavors not only taste great, they are an excellent source of vitamin C. Brizo boosts your immune system and is great for your post-workout recovery. Brizo, available on Amazon and at Brizo.com. We do a word of the day, so we're going to start off with that. Um, but as soon as Bob gets it together. Hey, let's start the show. <laughs> yes. Um, very excited today to have a very dear friend of mine uh, and I, a producer that I worked with on Beverly Hills Pond, the creator and producer, Beverly Hills Pond. I'll show you guys. This is one of the posters. Um, Mr. Anthony, otherwise known as Tony Amatulo, is on the show. Yes. I'm giving him a clap. And as I said in the beginning of the show, and Tony was not on, on the line with me here on Zoom, that he is truly one of the finest men in Hollywood and out of Hollywood. Just a class act. And um, I don't want to embarrass you, Tony, but um, you really truly made an impact on my life uh, working with you in so many episodes of Beverly Hills Pond. Um, and you just are just such a classy man. And I'm grateful to know you and call you my friend. So... Before we start the show. Actually, before we start that. Hey, Tony, can I ask you something? Can you sit up a little straight? I'm seeing your computer and your glasses. Okay. okay. Let me just. Better? Still yeah, now I can you. see them perfectly in your glasses. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, that's right better. There. Much that's better. Good. Hold that pose for the next hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, but. <laughs> Uh, we'll, ju we'll just deal with it. Go I ahead. think it's fine. Yeah, you can't. I'll, I'll, after great. effects, I'll put like circles and eye eyeballs right. in his glasses. Well, we have a word of the day and Bob is going to give us the word of the day. And you're going to try to guess it, Tony. All right. This is a phobia. You should, Corey, you should get this one. Huh. Oh, told him. Fear of men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, always. just kidding. Pignus phobia. It's called pignus phobia. P-I-G-N-U-S phobia. Pignus phobia. Phobia. Hold on, one more. Pignus phobia. That is the fear of. I'm going to say extreme colors. Mm, nope. Fear of pigs. <gasps> okay. You're a friend, and a woman on the show wrote a book. I don't know. Dominique what is wrote it? a book. Pignus. Oh yes, Dominique Panassi wrote a book called Pignus. So it's okay. the fear of writing books. <laughs> what is pig pigness is pawn it's the fear of pawn shops and pawn oh mm, good things. one way to good circle theory. around yeah circle back. how about it <laughs> very cool robert thank you yeah we you know try to robert we try to keep bob busy yeah yeah otherwise he gets in trouble <laughs> yeah well i'm the kid on the bus they made in charge so i would behave yeah well we're gonna clear that up right now uh Tony Amatulo is on the show today, and he's here to really mainly talk about um, your directorial debut. You've been in the business for a very, very, very long time. And just to name a few of your credits, A Smile Like Yours, Two Days in the Valley, Conflict of Interest, Dad, uh, The Goonies, Dead Silence, Miami Vice, Fame. I mean, it's it's a lot. Uh, that's just to name a few. And this is your directorial debut, uh, and the feature film is called Surviving on Less. And... It really is a fantastic film. So congratulations. Uh, the subject matter at the Sammy character is just honestly, he just brings you in and he warms your heart. And there's so much to this movie and I don't want to give it away because I really want people to watch it. Um, 
I know you is is the premiere tonight. We are, Corey. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show and to have your audience join us. I'm uh, privileged to be on board with you guys, so I appreciate it. I send everybody warm regards from New York City and uh, mm. and thankful to uh, be part of the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. This is what I'm saying. You're just top notch. Uh, but I know that tonight you do have a premiere Right. So the film is called Surviving on LES, which is a euphemism in New York City, is the Lower East Side, is like what the neighborhood is called. And the Lower East Side, Curry, as you know, having seen the film, is really has been over 100, 200 years, the welcoming in point for immigrants from the Italians to the Irish and the Jews. If people have come to New York, moved into the Lower East Side and started their journey into society, into the culture, and into being great Americans. And uh, the neighborhood is is still that way. It's it's uh, been primarily a Jewish neighborhood uh, for many, many years. And in with New York, in the last several years, uh, with real estate, Corey, it's just become extremely expensive and now quite fashionable. You know, there's Gucci, there's all these stores down there now. And so our story is a story of a haberdasher, a, a gentleman named Sammy, who runs a family men's clothing store and has been there for two generations and is trying to survive, as it were, on the Lower East Side, you know, with all the, the, the uh, you know, the uh, vegan pizza places and restaurants and, and what have you. So, <laughs> so my point of view is that there needs to be room in, in cities. And it's true, not just in New York, it happens in England, that happens around the world, is we're losing these cultural uh icons that people everything from the bodegas to uh to hat stores to the mom and pop stores so we make a stand on surviving on les with uh, with sammy and some un- unorthodox friends who come in to uh you know to help keep him afloat you know it's so funny i was in burbank yesterday with somebody and we were trying to get something to eat we walked into a coffee shop and they really didn't have anything so we asked the lady, are there places to eat? Oh, we've got tons of places. There's the rice place over there, the vegan place over <laughs> there, the uh, you know the alpha sprout place over there. And, like, and they all circle around Bob's Big Boy, the only remaining one. Yeah, I love so that like, place. All right, we're going to Bob's Big Boy. That's funny. <laughs> but that's true. And one of the things I loved about this movie is, um, you know, one of the taglines was the power of family, friends, and tradition. And I'm old school. I love tradition. Your family and your friends are everything. And I think it was this... Um, either somebody i can't remember who it was in the movie uh but they said i wrote this down because it it stuck out to me uh makes me want to cry um (laughs) he he said uh if we just keep the business open if we do that god will bless us yeah and so these are this is a man of faith and a community of faith that i'm sure at times that's all they've had to to rely on is that blind faith right where you just go okay well we're just going to trust that God has a plan, and He certainly sustained them. Um, uh, tell me, I know that if this goes way back for you. I, I read everything that you sent me, and you know, as a kid, you used to walk these streets. And so, tell me, you know, how this impacted you? What sparked this for you? I mean, it's such a beautiful, beautiful story. And by the way, the grandson in it. Um, He's in, very instrumental of keeping him. He's very funny, very charismatic, and he's adorable. Yeah. And he's very instrumental at keeping Sammy uh, up to up to speed and current, by the yeah. way. Yes. Well, it's funny you should mention that scene. The other scene, Corey, that resonated with me is Sammy is a Hasidim Jew. He's a religious man. He lives the values, and his father was the same. His father has passed, and he is, when, when his, before his father passed, he said to him, Sammy, keep the doors open uh, and God will bless us. And again, the, the dialogue was all taken. I did extensive interviews. We did, uh, I had uh, several writers come in and we took his backstory. I did, Corey, what uh, what, what uh, Chloe Zhao did on Nomadland, right? She, in that case, used re- real people as actors, but mostly in the minor roles. 
So I flipped it. I found real people and put them in the lead roles and surrounded them with wonderful, wonderful New York characters and actors who, you know, hold it together with, with, uh, with them. Oh, you did a great job. It was very well developed, the characters, and it was it's it's definitely a movie you've got to see. And I know that you are it is I think it's being um it's it gonna be in the Chelsea Film Festival. We were okay? in Chel- uh, last week Chel- Chelsea Film Festival. I'm happy to say I was actually in Europe with my wife, but uh we were my son went and my associate producer Barbara Wharton and they went and to my great surprise I woke up in the morning and found a text from my son saying, Dad, we won. So Oh yay. yay. Oh, how wonderful. Well, so let's just talk about that for a minute. I mean, this is your directorial debut and you're yes, already winning awards yes, for it. Film I've directed, but we won audience, best audience feature film, which again, it speaks to what you said, Corey, is that it's a, a story of the streets. It's a story of a common man. And it, it's very much a, my love letter to New York City. And I think it mm. resonated with, with the New York audience. So, So growing up in New York, how have you seen... And I was going to ask you this too, just in general, you know, Hollywood and New York, they're two different animals, right? Yeah. Uh, but have a, a similar com- commonality uh, to them. How have you seen the business um, change in the entertainment industry? Right. So uh, when I was in New York, uh, I graduated college in New York and then ended up moving to Los Angeles right after after that. And then ironically enough, one of the first shows I got hired on was to come back to New York to work. And back then there was very, very little TV. There was very, very uh, small filming because there was always union issues. You know, the unions in New York were notoriously difficult and, you know, uh, the, the only would work for five days a week and one of the weekends off. So there all these issues. So, so in LA, obviously, as you know, well, it's the opposite. Everybody works. There's always things, but somewhere along the way, you know, one of the mayors in New York figured it out. They hired a film commission and they, they streamlined everything. So, you know, so that changed the, the, the whole equation. Now we have amazing studios, the Steiner studios in Brooklyn, and we have, you know, uh, you know, huge crews. You go, don't go out like in LA, you don't go out, New York most days without running into a movie company somewhere. Right. And so tell me, when did you make, uh, when did you guys actually film Surviving on Less? Was it before COVID or was it during COVID or? It was actually right before COVID. You know, it took a long time. The COVID threw all our editing off. And then my partner uh, is is Israeli gentleman named David Lewis. So we did a lot of the editing in Israel of of all places. So it, again, it yeah, with the COVID, it, it, it threw everything off. So, uh, but we uh, we got it done uh, uh, recently, and as soon as we submitted it to Chelsea, they accepted it. And now this month, uh, the Bowery Film Festival, which uh, tonight is the uh, the opening of the event down in the Bowery in the, in the Lower East Side, Corey. And then our film is the last film to screen Friday night, which is closing night, right before the awards and the party. So I, I think that's a good sign. We're going to close the festival, so uh, we'll see. But uh, it'll be nice. It's a great see. sign. And we'll also see it on the big screen. You know, the the, the Chelsea Film Festival, Corey, was, uh, it was virtual because of the COVID, right? And so people couldn't go. But on, uh, on the Bowery on Friday night at 8.30 in New York time, we'll be on the big screen. So that'll be great for the cast and everybody as oh, well. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm just so excited for you. Uh, so I just want a little bit, and I want our listeners to know a little bit more about you, because I, I sure. talked all about you in the beginning, and you're just, you know, if there were only more people like you in Hollywood, <laughs> um, uh, I'll just leave it at that. But I, I wanted to know, um, you entered into the entertainment industry uh, with a goal of being a producer. This is your yeah. directorial debut, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so tell us the difference. Um, you know, the director, I've always said, and as you know, Tony, they they set the tone on the set because they're there every day and they set the tone. And I've worked with Joe Pitka and Harold Kronk and I've worked with some, you know, very fine directors um, and David Zucker. Uh, and it definitely each set has been different yes. and so i could only imagine and prayerfully one day i'll get to work on the set as you being the director you because you were certainly a fantastic producer Thank um you. but 
Tell me the difference for you, the producing well, and the I'll, director hat. Right. So I'll just tell you a, a little anecdote, which I think sums it up. When I was I was a vice president at Warner Brothers uh, Television for, for many years, and and so most of my career has been managing. I'm very good managing. I'm very good at rewriting. You know, I know my skill set, and that's that's what I've done for for most of the years. So stepping out of that. To, to direct is a different story. But if, for example, uh, when I was the vice president at Warner Brothers, one of the shows I was tasked with was called The West Wing. And I Aaron, love that show. <laughs> you, yeah. So, and, you know, Aaron Sorkin was in the, the heart and soul of that show. He was the writer. So my job was this, you know, as, as the executive at Warner Brothers was to make sure he got the scripts out, right? So I would stand outside his door, kind of tapping my foot, waiting for him to write the script. But my heart was saying, this guy's a genius. He should get all the time he wants. And, and you know, for what he's right. doing, it's so extraordinary. But as a studio exec, I had to wear that hat, right? But my heart was in the other place. So with this story, which is also close to my heart, when I was able to get my arms around it, I realized it was my story to tell. It was my love letter to New York. So I've kind of, you know, moved over to the other side from the production uh, business, maybe, and to uh, to the creative and to tell tell this one story uh, for the first time. Well, and it kind of goes to the the point of you know, and, and I don't want to get too preachy, but it, biblically it says, "Though it tarry, though it wait, though it lingers, wait for it." Yes. And it's like this has come full circle for you, and you've been able to, you know, uh, fulfill your heart's desire. You know, you, you've said love letter to New York, and it really is. If you watch the movie and you get a chance to see it, um, whoever's listening, um, I recommend it. It's a beautiful story of uh, it, there's so much in it. It's family, friends, and tradition, which, you know, the whole goal, Tony, for us to do do this podcast was to unite people yes, and to bring people together in a world that's so right now divided and broken. And this movie does that. Thank you for recognizing that. Again, if I could just mention one scene, which my Israeli partner wrote, because uh, sometimes, you know, then we did it on a shoestring budget and we were on uh, flying around, but there was one scene where Sammy, uh, is with Leroy, who's the black rapper. He's a young, beautiful <laughs> African American rapper. Yeah. And we put together David and I said, would be because Sammy's such a traditional religious man, it would be great if we could see the two worlds interact. So we, we come up with this scene where Sammy is talking to Leroy, the rapper, and says, you know, you know, I'm such a religious man. And he stops and he said, he said, my dad was a religious man too. Mm-hmm. And they find common, this common ground, Corey, you know, between this young African-American guy from Harlem and this uh, Sidham Jew from Brooklyn, you know, both bond over their faith and family, you know, and it was really it gave me chills. And again, we did it. Kind me of, too. I have them right now, actually. I know. Yeah. So we did it on the spot and both were authentic enough and good actors enough and, and soulful enough to, to uh, you know, to execute it. This episode is sponsored by Wild Art Gallery in Austin, Texas. Wild features art by Native American artists and has original fine arts prints and posters with prices for everyone. If you do not live in Austin, no problem. You can visit Wild's website at wyld.gallery. That's wyld.gallery. They ship nationwide and art is a great and unique gift for Christmas. If you do live in Austin, contact Ray at ray at wild.gallery. That's ray at wyld.gallery to set up an appointment to see their amazing art. Ray will be happy to discuss any piece of art on their website and in their gallery. That's wild.gallery for the most amazing art by Native American artists. Yeah, it was beautifully done. And that's the whole sole purpose of this uh, this podcast. And that's what, one of the things I loved about it. How long did it take for you guys to shoot it from beginning to end? You know, we are from the days, Tony, of, you know, it would take three, four, five, sometimes six months to shoot a film. So right. Sometimes you do the scenes uh, on the set or we, on the lots. We, yeah, we were about a month, you know, we just, uh, you know, again, I know enough for to schedule things, you know, from my other world of business and being a director's guild uh, production manager. I understand the nuts and the bolts, you know, but I must tell you, I did everything on this film. You know, I was in the morning 
getting donuts for people. You know, I, I have no ego. Bob's I'm going like this. It's, you know, it's like, let's make it, make sure the toilet's clean, you know, everything. You know, I just wanted, because people were working hard, they weren't being paid union wages, and it was an independent thing. So, again, we kept everybody happy, and I think that energy came through in, in the final product. Oh, it did. It's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. I wish I could have been there on the set with you. Some of my favorite days were when you would show up. You just brought this light to the set and uh, on Beverly Hills Pond, I'm speaking of, and uh, and you were always just such a a blessing to work with. I'm telling we you. Had a, we had, a, again, speaking of Beverly Hills Pond, we, I had a partner, a creative partner. I, I think we did pretty darn well. Yeah, we had a great time. Those were some of my favorites. Um, tell me about the two books you optioned and... I know you have an eye for talent. You have an eye for, you just, you know, you know, what is going to take off. You've been in the business such a long time. Uh, tell me about these two books that you optioned. Thank you. So again, I, th- these are stories that resonate with me. I get pitched things all the time. And obviously there's more things than there are time and money to do. So, uh, so the two current projects I have down the road, the first one is called, it's based on a book uh, by a woman named Saida Reus called The Assembly of the Dead. And it's a true story, 1906 Morocco, of a, of, a, of, a, of a serial killer. This gentleman actually killed all these women in Morocco and, and basically got away with it for, forever. So Saida, who was fascinated with that world, serial killer world is something I know knew nothing about. And it's a very specific world for certain people are attracted to it more than others. And uh but so it's it's an amazing story. And Saida wrote this book, uh, you know, where there's this kind of modern detective as much as you can be in 1906, who comes in and works with the 16 year old Sultan, you know, to help start to unravel and to and to and to give really it was the whole idea was to give voice to these women because these women were forgotten back then you know they were really uh their souls were were, were discounted you know they were not full people so if pe- women went missing families were embarrassed to report them or scandal wow. so you know that appealed to me and uh, and again we purposely hired women to write the screenplay i wanted two women i wanted the author and the other woman because i wanted that point of view so we certainly have we uh, have just completed the screenplay now and we're in the process of as your audience knows probably of shopping right we're taking it out you know it's a streamer series it'll be six eight ten episodes shot on location in Morocco. And uh, it's really a fastball down the middle. So I'm hoping we find a partner and uh, a studio, uh, someone will help. Uh, well, help us. as an actress, that would be an actor's piece. These are these some of these projects like that with that content that is cast contingent, right? That would just that makes in the whole entire production when you have someone that can dive into the psyche of of some of these women that you're talking about. That yes. sounds like a great role, just yes. just in case you're <laughs> looking for female actresses. Yes, well, we will indeed. And just then kidding. certainly just the, lead, the lead detective, Corey, is amazing because he's this oh, guy. Oh, I love it. He lives in both worlds. So anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have that when we have the script done and we're, we're all working hard yeah. to try to find, uh, find a, a network or a studio to work with. So but it's just just coming out now. That sounds like a great project. Um, and it sounds like a Netflix series. You know, yes. they've, have you ever seen the show? I'll talk for a second because it kind of is the show you. No. Oh, Tony, you've got to watch this show. Okay. It's, it's just called you. It's spelled. It's a series. Y O U. Okay. Yes. And I'm telling you, in fact, so probably some of those actors in that show would could cr- cross pollinate into your, this series. Cause I, it is, it's a phenomenal series and it's, I'll just let you watch it and then we'll Thank leave you. it at that. It's wonderful. It's a Netflix series. Um, what's the other project you were about? Well, the other project is, is 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 even uh, more. I only ask this, Tony. I ask these these th- this to you because you're very selective on the product projects that you choose. So that's why I'm asking you. Thank you. Yes. Well, this one is really it's the most exciting project, Corey. I think I've ever done. Ever done. Oh. It's called, her name is Elaine Black Yonida, and it's a true story, 
1930 San Francisco, and there's a book coming out. So I was able to meet the author and get the rights to the book. The book comes out in December. I, I ask your audience to please consider it. It's Elaine Black Yonita. And her story, Corey, just is, is, is one of the most extraordinary women uh, stories. It's a star turn for an actress when we make it. And basically, she was. Can you just can I just interject for one second? Can you spell her last name? Yeah, it's it's a Japanese Y O N E D A Yonida. Okay, just just to be clear. Okay, thank you. Rain Black Yonida, unknown, lost to history. I didn't know her. Nobody knows. But this scholar, uh, this woman, uh, did a uh, living in uh, Northern California, wrote an article on her, and it was so well received that she got from the publisher, the, 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 uh, the order to do the book. And so the book is coming out in December and, uh, and I got the rights, uh, the last two months. So we're just now in the process, but it's it, to be clear, Corey, it's a feature film. It's a star turn for an actress to play this woman. So I go too deep into it, but basically this woman was, was a, a, a person of the people, 1930 San Francisco, uh, married to an Irish guy in San Francisco who was a, a bit of a drunk and a bit of a ragged. And she would be working for the people in the union hall and, and helping organize and feed people. She was like Cesar Chavez before him. And, uh, and the husband comes in and says, what are you doing? So I'm at the meeting, says, no, you go home and cook me dinner. And she said, no. So he walks out, she divorces him. And in the course of doing that at the union hall is an organizer named Mr. Yonida, a Japanese gentleman. They meet, work together in the people's work, fall in love and get married. They get married and have a son and a daughter, right? So it's 1930s, it's the, the war breaks out, and Manzanar is looming in the background. Mm. They come, they knock on the door, and they take the fog. They take the fog. Oh, You're and kidding me. Then eight months later, they come back, Corey, they knock on the door and they want the son and it, to the concentration camp. And she says, nope. She says, I'm not going with Adam. So she's this incredibly strong Jewish woman who ends up going to Manzana, the only white woman to go to Manzana to live with 1,200 Japanese. Oh, my gosh. That's the story. I mean, and, and there's just. I would have done the same thing. Sorry, it, but you're not taking my kid without me. Yes. Right. You can imagine. But but her life was so multifaceted and she was really a pioneer in so many levels. So it's a great honor. I mean, it's a very important story that needs to be told. And I feel privileged because I know whoever plays her, the role, Corey, is a star turn, you know, to play this role and to tell the story. Yeah. So I'm very, very excited, you know, to, to again, I, I, I'm sure I could sell it as the TV streamer series, but I really would want to see it on the big screen with uh, with uh, with a Hollywood A actress. So. Well, and also, you know, it's so important for people like you and her uh, to make sure that this generation understands the generations that walked before us. And it sounds like a piece that can enlighten, you know, this generation on some, you know, we don't understand. Uh, and I'm not dissing this generation. I just don't think that some of the millennials understand the, the depths of, of how and what our ancestors walked they through to get they're here. they're not taught it anymore in school. Right. And so this is, sounds like a piece that is informational, educational, and inspiring, right? It is to me, Corey. Again, it's just uh, an extraordinary story of a time and place and a, a story of love of a mother and a family and... Uh, you know, and the prejudice, you know, again, that was felt the Japanese people, you know, at that time was so vilified that uh, it took in incredible courage for her to stand up and, and uh, represent her family. So, you know, the other day, I'm, I'm actually going back, I, I got a random text from my daughter, and she said, just randomly, thank you for always being there for me. Just wanted to tell you, I appreciate you. And this makes me wow how long did you cry after <laughs> i that? cried for like 45 minutes but yeah. nonetheless um you know i've just been a mom and but i think about this woman who you know 
put herself in that position for her child and and that's an incredible you know i don't want to say sacrifice but you know that's we would do anything for our children but this just sounds wonderful so the book is by elaine black yanita is, is there a title to this book or is that, that that's the name of the book that's the name of that's the, book. the name of the book okay okay and is that going to be the name of the movie you know it's so interesting i was i was doing some work on manzana which actually means ironically enough apple orchard right that's where the, hmm. the japanese were put so so it just you know what the, the title's always subject to what the studio wants but it just seems like you know you know troubled orchard or you know the, the irony of being in a beautiful orchard where you're in a concentration camp is uh is is not lost on me so um so yeah we'll see but the book is eby elaine black unita and uh like i say it'll it's it's published through temple uh publishing house and uh it'll be out mid-december so i, I can send you a link at some point and um yeah no i we love books on this show i, I love promoting books and people seem to really take to we them. both read <laughs> you're yeah. hilarious um tony i just want to know more about you know because I've only been in this business, well, only, I shouldn't say that, for about 28, 30 years. Yeah, that all. Since I was two. <laughs> <laughs> just, ki just kidding. Um, but I know you've been in it a long time as well. And I know a lot of us are talking about, you know, the transitions with streaming. And, you know, I, I used to go to all my auditions on the Paramount lot, Warner Brothers lot, Sony lot, Fox lot, you know, yeah. the, the actual where, you know, they would film everything. Really, they had a spot for the ocean. They had a spot for the, you know, New York. They had all the sets were already built. They'd do a little tweaking here and there. And we would just kind of, you know, it was all kind of in this Raleigh studios, you know. Yes. How have you seen it change? I, I mean, I, a lot of our listeners are, they, they like to know, you know, the inside of Hollywood and, and the details. And so having gone through several different, generations of Hollywood, what would you say the biggest changes coming up? Um, well, uh, again, I mean, everything is virtual now. You know, when you do an audition, you don't go in the room anymore, which is too bad because there's nothing like eye contact. And for you as an actress to be in front of producers and directors, is, is valuable. So, and certainly COVID didn't help that case. So the fact that things are virtual, the fact that CGI now, I mean, we're talking about with this uh, tragedy with Baldwin, you know, about, you know, putting yeah. you know, gunshots in and doing everything through, you know, CG, you know, so that's the other big uh, change you know but ultimately you know story is story you know and people want to relate at some level human level Corey and and as long as you have a story like I do with surviving on LES and Elaine Black Unita it's the quality of people's lives and the experience of being human and being frail and being screwed up and being successful I think that's what people you know that still still works on the Hollywood level so. what do you think will happen to the studios I think the studios are dinosaurs. I think you know the 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 uh, the meteor has hit and uh, people don't quite realize it yet, right? The uh, the blackout is coming. So, which you know, again, you look at films like Miss Zhao did, you know, which is No Man Land, which is just a small, wonderful story, you know. And you, she went out with her husband and lived in a van and moved around, and so that. I think speaks more to, you know, uh, for young people that there's more opportunity. You can do films if you, ha if you have a passion to tell your story. You know, I encourage people to do it. You know, you don't need a million dollar budget. You know, you can go out. People can shoot for things with their phones enough to get attention or get in a short film festival. Sometimes it just takes one thing for somebody to say, oh, I would love to be in business, blah, blah, blah. So people have to follow their passion and... Uh, and if they believe in something, I, I strongly suggest they uh, they take a shot at it. So do you think it's almost like the record industry where in the 50s and 60s you needed a big studio and millions of dollars to make an album, and now any kid with a computer and a, and a, a digital audio workstation can make a, a song and make an album? Right. Yeah, it's not quite that right? but i mean again you know there's there's more avenues than ever to get in you know again in the old days everybody had to be in sag or be in dga or be in after so now there's a whole non-union world that has opened up that allows people to percolate up and if you have the talent and a little bit of luck you know you'll you'll find your way in so 
The surviving on less was was a little independent, but it looks uh, the look of it. I don't know what kind of cameras you used or lighting, but the look of it looks like a you know five million dollar movie. Uh, it looks great, and I and I having done one myself, the little God's not dead. That was a one point two million dollar budget, and they uh -huh. you can do a lot in the editing rooms nowadays. Right. Well, again, we did uh, surviving on LES for, for a price, and again, our goal now, Corey, is to share the film. We don't have distribution. That's always the curse of, hmm. of funding your own movie, right? So we're doing the what they call the award circuit. So we're doing the film. Uh, awards that we're doing tonight and we did with Chelsea. So we're hoping, we're praying that we get one, you know, one uh, person that says, oh, we'd love to put this in, you know, this film should play in Israel, this film should play in Europe, you know. Again, it's a story of a New Yorker, but it certainly is uh, an evergreen story. So I'm very much now, uh, and my son, Nico, who's the associate producer, is working uh, to find um, find distribution, you know, which is again a different world for me. I'm used to being on the other side, in the studio side. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. I'm an independent filmmaker looking for a distributor. So even though I have all my contact and knowledge, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. So if there's any of your any of your listeners or distributors out there, please uh, mm. please take a look. My and producer you, you, have is a, you have a producer whose ears just perked up. We'll yeah. talk about it off camera, but I have a a, a way to do that for you. Yeah. Okay, well. Um, tell me, that's 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 what I was going to say. But tell me. Hey, doing you, the show really pays off, huh? <laughs> um, well, you couldn't work with a finer a finer man, Tony. I thought, I thought Tony you were talking about yourself. Tony Amatula. I thought you were talking about yourself. Um, no. <laughs> um, couldn't, what, work with a, couldn't work with a finer host. <laughs> what was your, your experience? Because I know you as a producer, as a husband, and a and a father, um, and you get A plus in all of those uh, areas, by me anyway. Um, but what was your experience like um, with working with Nico? I mean, we've been to my daughter's uh, uh, water polo games before, which you can put right. that picture up. If Is that okay if she puts that picture up? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, so I know what kind of dad you are, and you brought your son with you. So yes. um, tell me what it was like working with him. It's it's well, it, and is this his passion? Thank you. So I have two sons, Leonardo and Nicolas. Uh, so Leonardo is uh, is went to the University of Oregon. He lives in LA and is working in 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 uh, in, in LA in, in logistics. His first job and loves it. He's with a small mom and pop company, and he's getting to grow and do stuff. Nico, uh, who's one year older, uh, is an actor and uh, uh, and the creative type. So he, you know enjoys being on the set and again there's nothing better whether it's my son or not i love mentoring young people i like nothing better you know yeah. th than giving it back because i've been you know treated over the years and so uh so he was clever you know he he's, he appears in the film he's one of the people who come in the young people for the pop-up sale if you remember and yes. uh and again, you know, I'm, you know, this is my son. I said, you know, clean the bathroom, get the coffee, get the donut. You know, it's like learn from the bottom <laughs> up because that's how I learned, you know. So, uh, so we had fun, you know, but the whole, it was a very good energy with the crew and uh, people, uh, you know, at first they were shaking their heads. You can imagine dealing with Sammy because he's so, you know, unorthodox and, and such a big personality that people had trouble, you know, focusing on who this guy really was. And we just kept rolling. You know, we didn't let any opportunity get away. No, it was so great. Did you see it, Bob? Not yet. Oh, it's, you have to watch it with. Um, well, if you're going to distribute it, you got to yeah. see it. Yeah, I, I'll, well, I was going to say, send me a. Do, do you have I a, sent um, it to you. Oh, did you? Okay. Yes, I a sent screener? it to you. I sent yeah. you what? You have the watermark copy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the yeah. screener. Okay, great. Yes, yes, yes. It's great, and uh, and Irina, his wife, is from Ukraine. I didn't okay. say the Ukraine. The Ukraine. Uh, they don't like it when I say the Ukraine, but she will love it because there's a sense of you know nostalgia with. You know, I, I always find it funny because you talked about keeping, reserving the haberdasheries and all the old business and stuff. And it was funny when you go to Jerusalem and stuff, you see this building that's been there for 3,000 years. You go, oh, you know, Christ healed somebody in front of that building and they stayed in there. What is it now? Oh, now it's a 7 Eleven. And like <laughs> everything around there is like, you know, oh, it was a photo mat for years and now it's like a, you know, a Bob's Big Boy or something like that. But yeah, because the building's still, you're going to Philadelphia. 
there are buildings three, four hundred years old. Yeah. And they're all nothing like, you know, those stereo discount stores and all those going out of business for 10 year stores. That's, you know, right next to Independence Hall. Is that all? I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are we playing make fun of each other? Okay, no, we're not. We're not. We're not. There was, this is about Tony Abenchulo today. We're uh, my <laughs> friend. I can call my friend and. Hey, Tony, you know, you know what Corey's favorite line is? What? Yes. You're great, Bob. What is it? You're great, Bob. Yeah. He he, s- he takes these. No, 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 don't explain it. Sound bites. <laughs> and he makes them. I like it. You're into, right on it, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> into Bob. Got 75 episodes of you saying, I can piece all the words together. Okay, I said, I love Bob, just so you know, Tony. And that was no. from Bob Zaney, who I'm sure you're familiar with. He's a yes. comedian. Okay. comedian. Got it. Yes. Was okay. it this time, too? I love it. You're so sweet, Bob. Oh, gosh, I tell you, Tony. That's, that's what, what this producers was, will do. Good producers yeah. will do that. They'll get you. <laughs> well, a little fun fact on, on Beverly Hills Pond. One of the first episodes, I I won't even say who the director was, nice guy, but not director, yes, director. And he kept trying to get me to say a word. I'm not going to say the word. Uh, You know. um, uh, Was it a cuss word? No, it wasn't. It's just sometimes they'll interject things like silly, you know, so I had to be very careful. You have to be very careful. um, And I just didn't want to. And and so we had this stare down. I won, of course. uh, But. (laughs) It, you know, you've got to, you do have to be careful when it's reality, because uh, that's that that was my likeness that I was portraying. But they did yeah. a great job, and they were they were kind and and very gracious. We're not like that here. If you mess up, it's going to be all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I mess up on a daily basis, Tony. What can I say? Um, yeah. So, tell us. Oh, that's oh right, thanks. You do. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm just so very excited to have Tony here. I don't, I don't get a chance. We don't, you know, in this business, you make contacts and you make relationships, and it's very important. And to anyone listening, you, even starting out or not, making those contacts is so important. And you don't, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily f- um, reach out on a daily basis, but when you make that contact, you cultivate a trust and a relationship that yeah. you can call on years later, or. Yes. A reach out and we it's kind of a uh, an unknown you know thing that you just you're there for each other right, right. you're just there for each other yes. and that's what we're trying with this movie surviving on less and what you're trying to do and we're trying to do collectively is to be there for one another and that kind of translates into your neighbor your your neighbor's neighbor and you know right now specifically with all that's going on politically and spiritually and intellectually and relationally we've got all these little individual dividers and if we can just be one person that brings people together like you're doing um then we're we're blessed are the meek right for they will inherit the earth yep well you're doing good work Corey. i've seen the other episodes and the great guests you've had and uh it's always a uplifting uh story to be told and lord knows we need them so so he was the guy that watching our show, huh? Yeah, the one. Yeah, the one. <laughs> well, um, Mr. Amatulo, we have a, a three questions that we close sure. uh, on. But I, I first want to say, surviving on less, watch it. It is uh, Lower East Side. Less no, is not a person. It means yeah. Lower East Side. Right. And Tony has had grown up in New York and knows what it's like all I- in general. And this is his love letter to New York, which I love that. That's beautiful mm-hmm. um, yes. that you got a chance to say that and write that. And now it's on camera and the world can see it's your directorial debut. So I'm very excited and very happy for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would ask you three words that describe Tony Amatulo. Three words to describe, I would say uh, abundance, love, and uh, and uh, the third one would be uh, faith. I would say, just, and I've never really done this, I would say uh, a class act. <laughs> Those are my three words to you, Tony. Well, we had um, fun you are. We brilliant, brilliant in that show that kept us on for three years. We really had a lot of fun, Corey. Thank so I'm you. always thankful when, you know, I find an actress who can, you know, deliver the goods. And, you know, it's just a Thank pleasure you. to reunite on this podcast. And, uh, you know, we'll hopefully, uh, you know, 
scheme something we have we're both young enough pups to find another another adventure <laughs> Well, I would love to. I'm just saying this. I would love to do a New York pawn, Lower East Side pawn. No, no more pawn. I'd love to be. I would love to because I know how you are as a producer. I'd love to be be uh, for for you to direct me at some point. Um, I have two more questions. One, we used to have a Rorschach test, so some of the shows you saw might you might have seen may have seen the Rorschach test, but I won that battle, and that is now currently gone for the moment. You know. Since we stopped doing it, you've learned how to pronounce it. Thank you. <laughs> and so we have implemented a um, a you don't know what it is word association yeah. test. <laughs> and Not you know what I'm test. so mad about? What if I knew the word they were trying to get you to say on Beverly Hills Pawn? I would have put it on that list. <laughs> <laughs> I will never tell you. It wasn't anything bad. They weren't trying to get me to say anything bad. But um, there's uh, a few words here, and I'm gonna say one word, the word, and then you just give me just your immediate response, like one word, if you can. So let's do family. Love. Hollywood. Trouble. <laughs> I love it. I have to agree. Uh, history. Important. Mm. New York. Gotham. Ah, good one. Studios. Dinosaurs. Yeah. Produce. 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 Sorry. <laughs> to produce. Or producer. Tightrope walker. Tightrope walker. Ooh, that's really good, Tony. Really good. That If that doesn't give you a visual of that actual... <laughs> Really great. You're a writer. Uh, and oh, he put, Bob writes these words. He put Corey. Spirit. Oh, See, that's why I do things like you. that. Well, somebody's got to compliment you. Can't be me. <laughs> thank you. Did you just smack me, air smack me? No, I just like <laughs> that. Um, and our last but not least is um, we usually ask for celebrity crush, but I will tell you, as, as I know, Tony very well. He's madly, hopelessly, and devoted to his lovely wife, who is beautiful, wonderful, amazing woman. Um, but not necessarily a crush. But who inspires you uh, in life, or in the industry, or not in the industry? Somebody who inspires you. Okay. Well, this. If I shed a tear, so just so people Aww. know, the history, I had a childhood friend, the wonderful, wonderful character actor named Bruno Kirby. Bruno was in Godfather mm. Part Two. Harry met Sally, and he and I, Corey, were brothers. You know, and his he was a young actor, and really was my introduction to to the business. So Bruno, we lost a while ago, uh, unfortunately, from leukemia. But his work with Matthew Broderick, I mean, at the memorial, everybody spoke from Gary Shandling to Matthew to Sarah Jessica. And, mm. you know, the love in that room was just uh, stays with me every day. And Bruno is my soul brother. And uh, uh, everything I do uh, has some roots back to him. So uh, so I feel blessed to have him. He always considered me his best friend. And the true story, we had dinner with Matthew Broderick in Chinatown once. And Bruno, if you knew me, if you knew Bruno, you knew me. And Bruno would talk so much to Matthew and everybody, uh, you know, Tony Amatulo, this and, you know, for whatever reason. And finally, the three of us would have dinner in Chinatown one night. And I walked, I was there early and I sat down and Matthew came in second. And I was sitting at the table. He said, are you him? I said, what? He said, are you him? Are you the Tony Amatulo? I said, yes, I'm the Tony. So instead of me saying, are you Matthew Broderick? He's saying, are you him? And that speaks not so much to me, but, but to Bruno and how proud he was of our friendship and, and the mm-hmm. foundational love we had as, as, as you know, as, as, as dear friends. So, so Bruno That's Kirby. That's so beautiful. I love that. Well, we'll dedicate the show to Bruno Kirby. How about that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tony Amatulo, I love you and your family. Please give um, your beautiful wife a yeah. big hug and and the boys. And thank I you. can't thank you enough for taking this time. We I will continue to lift up um, 
this project, Surviving on Less, and pray that it just reaches the mass and they can understand and take away that family, friends, and tradition is just so incredibly important. And to stay united and together and yes. um, just keep pursuing your dreams and never give up. That's what I get from you. You, you just keep doing this and you do it because you love it. You do. Yeah. It's truly yeah. because you love it. And God does bless you. He brings you interesting, amazing projects. So thank you so much for following your heart, because you do. Your heart is in every project that you've ever done. You you do. It's not about the fame and fortune for you. And I know that. And I'm just speaking on your behalf for you, because you you just you would come to the set and you would sit and settle in and be present and in the moment. And there aren't a lot of people that I met in this business or in life. And so I'm crying because it's a beautiful quality to have. And, um, and I thank you because you are an example. And, um, and I appreciate you. So thank you so much, Tony Amatulo. You're very generous. Thank you, Robert, for the work. And Corey, we love you. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, keeping you abreast on all our new adventures. So thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Audience, you're very welcome. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Have a great night tonight, okay? Thank you. I'll send you a note. Okay. And Thank we're you. out. The Coriolis Effect is produced by Jazz Productions. Producers Corey Oliver and Bob Victor, host Corey Oliver, editor Bob Victor, and assistant editor Kate Bonsall. Hi, guys. I'm Corey Oliver, and thank you for watching The Coriolis Effect. We hope you enjoyed the previous episode. Here are some more episodes you might enjoy. Hit the subscribe button below, and have a great day.